to try to have a model that generates bigger fluctuations in labor market variables such as unemployment and tightness, uh, people realize that you had to introduce rigid wages. So uh, this is what we call the rigid wage model. So in terms of assumption, we said we're looking at production functions and wage function. So in the rigid wage model, the production function remain linear. So that output was just productivity times number of producers. But what changed was the wage function. Now we got rid of bargaining here, and instead uh, the wage was rigid. And so the wedge looks something like this. A scalar omega times productivity with some elasticity gamma, gamma capturing the rigidity of wedges. And so what's key here is that gamma was strictly less than one, um, which leads to some rigidity. If gamma is equal to one, your wedge becomes proportional to productivity. It, it becomes flexible. And as we saw in that case, there are no fluctuations in your employment and vacancy, so your problems are not solved. And so the person who um, pioneered this approach was uh, Bob Hall in a famous 2005 article. And he showed that once you introduce rigid wages, uh, so that's the rigid wage model, once you introduce rigid wages, you could generate realistic fluctuations in unemployment vacancies and tightness. Um, something I could have said, so the standard model, the original one with linear production function bargaining, that's the model that you would learn if um, you were you know, taking a course on the matching model in uh, most other places. So that's usually that's the model that's taught almost everywhere and also in almost all textbooks. Um, people haven't really moved past that, although as we are showing, there are clear limitations, the absence of fluctuation as well as as we're going to talk about now, the absence of job rationing. Uh, but nevertheless, if you, you, know, you uh, move to other places, uh, or you know people in other places who learn about this material, that's usually what they learn. The people only teach the standard model, which you know, I think is a bit silly because then you miss really the richness of the matching framework. There are so many other things you can do beside the standard model. Okay, so we have this rigid wage model. So what's the issue here? Well, <clears throat> the issue is a little bit different. The issue is the rigid wage model. In fact, an issue that is um, shared with the standard model is that um, if uh, matching frictions disappear, unemployment completely disappears. So all unemployment is frictional in that model. Okay, so that's the main that's the main problem. Uh, that's the main issue here. So all unemployment is unfrictional. We'll define uh, in a second. We're going to define more formally what frictional unemployment is. Uh, but what that means is that uh, at some intuitive level, if matching frictions disappear, all unemployment um, disappears. Uh, so another way to say that is that um, if workers search infinitely hard, <coughs> uh, 
because of course if you have an infinite uh, job search effort that's going to make uh, the matching frictions totally irrelevant uh, you know, if people are able to put an infinite amount of search um, the fact that there is some matching friction is just not going to be relevant the labor market will be swamped by that search effort uh, so if workers search infinitely hard unemployment again disappears Another way to put it, then focusing more on firm, is that if recruiting is costless, because on the firm side, the reason why matching frictions impede uh, hiring is that there is a cost associating with uh, posting vacancies. If it was free to post vacancies, firms could post infinitely many vacancies and they could just hire whoever they want, whenever they want. So it would be really a world uh, as if it would be like as if you were on a competitive labor market, it would be if you are in a world without friction. So, if recruiting, uh, if recruiting is costless, once again, what would happen is that your unemployment uh, would disappear. So these are all manifestations of that um, of the fact that all unemployment is frictional. So why is that an issue? Why do we think that actually the world uh, doesn't work like this? Well, it's because uh, we know that even when recruiting for firms is costless, <coughs> unemployment doesn't disappear. Even when workers are desperate to work, we know that unemployment doesn't disappear. How do we know that? Because anytime we have a big recession, people queue for jobs at factory gates, in front of you know, firms, uh, doors, at job bureaus, um, at job conventions. You have so many people who want to work, so, so they are desperate to work, so they are putting this essentially costless, and yet there is still a lot of unemployment. So how do we know that? I've just gathered a couple of pictures just to illustrate this. <clears throat> These are classical pictures, mostly from the Great Depression. They are fairly well known from that time. Um, so this is a picture of a queue of uh, workers who are uh, you know, waiting to apply from, for, for jobs in the US during the Great Depression. So you see a massive line of workers desperate to work. <laughs> this is um, another picture. Uh, this is at a job bureau during the Great Recession. So you know, a place where you could go and job your advertise and people could apply for, 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 uh, for jobs and you can see people all these workers fighting to try to get uh, to get a job. This is another job queue again during the Great Depression in the U.S. Again, here you have workers uh, waiting uh, for jobs. So queues were everywhere. If you've seen uh, that great Charlie Chaplin movie, Modern Times, uh, it, exactly the same happened. You know, uh, Chaplin, the character played by Chaplin, is unemployed and. Um, trying to get a job and then the newspaper in the morning he sees that some factory is hiring and so he rushed to get into the factory and there so is this huge crowd of people waiting to try to get a job and he managed to sneak in and then that's when he starts working in that uh, in that factory um, but these are really kind of well-known images of the time of the great depression there was this huge uh, these huge queues and <clears throat> um, actually when when i talk about that often people say well you know, this was a Great Depression, this was a different time. So first people say we'll never get that amount of unemployment anymore, which is not exactly true. I mean, during the COVID recession, we got to 15% uh, and there was maybe even more unemployment that wasn't registered. So these things can happen again. Uh, and then they say, well, yeah, but the queues, we, you know, this is not something that we see anymore. But that, that's not true. So it's true that recruiting has changed. Now you don't necessarily need to go to the factory gates to get a job, you can apply online and stuff. But you still see queues for jobs. Um, and I have this uh, picture that was taken in the UK during the Great Recession. Um, so this is a picture of people who are applying um, for jobs, I think at the London Zoo. So there was one position that opened at the London Zoo and all these people queued to try to get 
to get that job. So you still see queues today. Uh, so it, it remains important to allow for queue in your model if you want to have a good description of what's, uh, what's happening. Okay, um, so this was just to illustrate and so that you can remember this idea that <coughs> people do queue for jobs uh, in bad times. Right, so uh, this is the issue. Um, so the model does not allow uh, for uh, queues of workers in bad times. Um, so how do you solve that? How do you fix this? Well, the problem is that there is no lack of job in the model, if you want. If there are no matching frictions, all the workers are going to be absorbed in the model. All the workers are going to be absorbed. And so the way to the way to fix it uh, is to introduce a notion of a number of jobs demanded by firms. So basically, you want to you remember um, the labor demand in these models with linear production function is horizontal, right in our diagram. So just determine the tightness, no employment. So it means that if you push the labor supply, for instance. Further out, firms are just going to absorb. If more workers want jobs, firms are just going to absorb them. So the way to resolve that was actually to introduce a proper downward sloping uh, labor demand. Let's see. So that was the solution to fix that problem. And we'll see that once you introduce a proper downward sloping labor demand, then you have this you have the concept that there is a certain number of jobs in the economy. <coughs> and if the labor demand is depressed, it's possible actually that the demand is not sufficient. And even if recruiting was free, even if people were desperate to work, not all workers will find, will find a job. Okay? And so this, once you do that, this gives you a model, a matching model that allows for uh, job rationing. Okay, so that can capture and that's if you want the third uh, generation of the matching model. You have the standard model, then you have the rigid weight model, which is second generation, then the third generation is a model with job rationing that captures that allows not only for fluctuations on the labor market but also captures that uh, lack of job in the uh, in the economy. In that case, that allows for um, job rationing. Uh, 